Hey guys, so I'm going to be reading chapter 3 from Tiger Tiger. So I actually just did a read aloud for chapter 2, but my recording was so long that it will not let me upload it to YouTube, so I'm going to be working on that. But right now I'm just going to read chapter 3, and I'm probably just going to break it up into two parts. Okay, so chapter 3 is the naming. The younger and smaller cub, still lacking a name, spent the night alone in his cage in the city menagerie where he was to live. His brain was full of new things, new bewilderments. Having his fangs drawn had been terrible, but the pain was fading and with it the memory of his terror and agony. He thought about the male two legs that had comforted him, making soft sounds to him and giving him milk to suck, reminding him dimly of his lost big one. Not all two legs were either things to fear or things he might like to eat. They were certainly meat, but they were more. They were powerful and puzzling and even fearsome, but also they could do pleasing things. He thought of the female two legs with the eyes that had looked into his. He wanted to creep to her and lick the blood off her hand after she had provided him with food. Encourage that hand to scratch and stroke him again. He sensed no threat, but he was not certain. He hadn't seen anything like her before. Where was his brother? That was the most important thing. They had been a pair, and now that he had ended, and now that had ended, and he was alone. In the darkness, there was no warm, friendly other to curl up against, no familiar smell, and no one to communicate with. He slept at last, miserable, aching, and lonely. But in the morning, things were better. The male two legs came back and made sounds to him and petted him. There were others like with him, but the cub only noticed the one he knew. Today would have been a bad day for you, Tigress, but you're lucky again. She's forbidden it, so I've got something for you instead, so that you won't forget yourself and do her mischief. The two legs reached down into the cage and began to rub the cub's belly. Instinctively, he rolled over and stuck his big feet in the air. Before he understood what was happening, something was slipped over each of, his, each of them, something that muffled his claws. He rolled over swiftly and stood up, sniffing this new addition to his body. He didn't like it. He caught the stuff in his teeth and tried to pull it off, but he couldn't. It fitted tightly around his legs and was too strong to tear. He rolled and rubbed and bit, but it was useless. The young two legs watched him, and when he could, scratched the cub's ears. Get used to it, friend. You're a shod tiger now, and you must wear them till you learn good manners, till you can be trusted. If that day ever comes, said one of the others. But the cub understood only that when he tried to walk, he couldn't properly feel the ground under his feet and learn from it. He didn't yet know that he couldn't use his claws, but when his day's meat was brought to him, he found out. He was used to pinning the meat down with his claws and chewing chunks off it, but this meat was in small pieces. He didn't realize that it was cut up because his jaws ached too much to chew properly. All he knew was that he couldn't hold it. He couldn't rend it. He was no longer whole, no longer what he had been. What he knew he was meant to be. He was muffled. He was less. When he was taken to the female two legs, he was already angry. She took one look at him and began to make a mouth noise. Oh, look, he's got boots on. Yes, princess, it was Caesar's orders when he heard that you'd forbidden us to draw his claws. She cap he capered her about joyfully. I couldn't think of a name for him, but now I have it. I'll call him Boots. The cub named Boots, without knowing he'd been named, watched her, surprised because she whirled like a peacock. She had no tail, but she had something like a tail that sparkled and flared. She made a noise rather like a peacock, too, but she still looked like a big monkey to him, and she smelled good. He sensed she wasn't as strong as the males. He thought he would like to eat her, but only if the male two legs wasn't there to put his hand on the cub's neck and stop him. But the big two legs didn't go away. He stayed. He took the cub out of the cage. The cub liked being held by the two legs. It made him feel very safe. It was strange, smelling his food smell, and at the same time, liking to be held close to him. The anger was still there because of what had been put on his feet, but he already knew better than to bite the male two legs. The puzzling thing was that he no longer wanted to. That day he learned to play. Of course he had played before with his brother, but not for a long time, not during the bad time in the dark, in the dark rocking place. They had been too fearful and wretched, but now he remembered it was good to chase something that rolled along the ground, to catch it and leap with it, knocking it into the air and batting it with his paws. He almost forgot that they were muffled. The female two legs made the peacock noise and the rain on leaves noise with her front feet. She crouched down and made the same sound over and over again. Boots, boots. He sensed she wanted him to come to her and he wanted to go. 
At first, she was too timid, and then the male two legs picked him up and put him down close to her. She smelled good, and her paws, when she touched him, were knowing and cunning amid his fur, scratching and stroking in ways that made him squirm and lie on his back and rumble deep in his chest. He had a vague memory of the rough tongue and the warm flanks and the nipple that filled his mouth with sweet flowing power. He hadn't forgotten his brother either, and his brother hadn't forgotten him. The bigger, stronger cub was not frolicking with the tender, laughing female two legs, being fed tidbits of meat in a pleasant, sunlit open place. He was in a dark, bad-smelling, closed-in place under the ground. He knew he was under the ground because he had been carried in his cage down a long flight of steps into dimness and coldness. He growled and snarled all the way and tried to reach through the bars to claw the bodies of those who carried him, but he couldn't. At last, he was released from the cage. The front of it was raised by some invisible agent, and he came out with one bound, only to find his way blocked by cold black stone. There was a clang behind him as bars came down. His thoughts were all confusion, rage, frustration. His stomach churned and threw up bitterness into his mouth. He clawed the hard, stopping walls. It was useless. At last, he stopped. He put his front paws onto the wall and stretched his neck, but he couldn't see anything beyond. He had never felt so alone in his life. He had never been alone till now. He whined miserably. A coarse, loud voice shouted, Quiet, you little brute, or I'll give you something to howl for. The threat in it was unmistakable. The bigger cub urinated with fear, then found a corner, pressed himself tight to the cold wall, and lay down. He didn't sleep. He was too nervous. He shivered, and all his striped fur stood on end. There had been something in that voice that filled him with dread. For several days, no two lugs came near him. He could hear them at a distance shouting. His food was pushed between the bars at the front of the prison on the end of long poles, while the cub clawed and gnawed it. As the days passed, he lost condition and became listless with misery. Two days went by without any food, and then the teasing started. The cub sensed something bad was going to happen when a two legs came into the dark place and made sounds that were the same as the shouting from afar. Unlike his brother, the cub had never had kindness from two legs, and all he knew of them was that they were the all-powerful source of food and fear. This two legs, very big and very threatening, stood over him as he lay in the corner he had chosen as a sleeping place. The cub didn't know the nature of the threat, but he knew he was afraid and helpless. He held himself alert as he lay with his head on his forepaws. Get up, you, growled the two legs, and it was a growl, deep in his throat, the sort of growl tigers make. It was almost the language the cub understood. The words meant nothing, but the threat was clear. He didn't move. The man prodded him sharply with something he carried. The cub lifted his head and snapped at the thing that had hurt him, but it wasn't there anymore. Get up, the two legs growled again. When the cub still didn't move, the two legs jabbed him again. This time, the sharp thing nearly pierced his hide. He jumped up with a snarl of pain and swiped at the thing with his claws. It went away, came back, jabbed again, was snatched away before the cub could seize it. Okay, I'm going to stop here and then I'm going to start another video.